President Biden teaming up with Senator Bernie Sanders to slam former President Trump over health care. But new polling and last night's primary results are posing fresh warning signs to President Biden's 2024 campaign. Joining us live now is NTD's White House correspondent Iris Tao. Good evening, Iris. What's the latest in this race between Biden and Trump? Good evening to you, Steve. So as this week Trump continues to hammer Biden on the border crisis, President Biden today teamed up with his one-time presidential rival, Senator Bernie Sanders, to attack Trump on health care. Here's Bernie Sanders and President Biden accusing Trump of trying to cut Social Security and Medicare while vowing to fund these programs by raising taxes on wealthy Americans. Watch. As my predecessor says, kicking millions of Americans off their health insurance. I'm going to protect Social Security and Medicare along with Bernie and other members of Congress to make sure the wealthy begin to pay their fair share. We will be lowering the cost of health care in our country. Former President Trump, meanwhile, has pushed back on Biden's accusations, saying while he wants to cut government ways, he will never do it through cutting Social Security or Medicare. Meanwhile, Bernie Sanders' public show of support for Biden today could give Biden some boost with voters in the progressive and young voters' wing, which were critical to Biden's victory in 2020. And that could be another reason why we're seeing the two teaming up together at this moment, Steve. Yeah, Iris, along with uh, abortion and democracy, President Biden increasingly making the health care issue a pillar of his 2024 campaign. New polling, however, showing warning signs for uh, the current president. Tell us more about this. Right, so a new poll by the Wall Street Journal is now showing that President Biden is trailing behind former President Trump in six of seven battleground states that's in part fueled by voters' concerns over the economy and Biden's job performance. And in Wisconsin, which is the one swing state where Biden is leading, he's also facing new challenges. In Wisconsin's primary last night, over 40,000 voters voted uninstructed, similar to an uncommitted vote there, in protest of Biden's handling of the war in Gaza. And meanwhile, that's more than double the margin that President Biden won in Wisconsin in 2020. And former President Trump, who was campaigning in Wisconsin last night, also publicly again challenged President Biden for a one-on-one -on -one debate. Watch. We have an empty podium right here to my right. You know what that is? That's for Joe Biden. I'm trying to get him to debate so that we can discuss in a friendly manner the real problems of our country of which there are many, instead of trying to have corrupt prosecutors fight your battles for you. That's no good. We got and President Biden has previously responded to Trump's call for a debate, saying it will depend on Trump's behavior. So a lot to watch for in the coming months about if and when we're going to get another debate between Biden and Trump this year. Steve. NCD's Iris Tower reporting live from the White House. Thank you, Iris. And the White House is asking Congress to approve a multi-billion dollar weapons sale to Israel. This while publicly expressing outrage over the deaths of seven humanitarian aid workers killed in an Israeli airstrike. Our Washington correspondent Luis Martinez has more. The Biden administration has sent notices to two congressional committees to begin the review process of a weapons deal that would see the transfer of 50 F-15 fighter jets to Israel. The deal would total over $18 billion and would be the largest weapons sale to Israel in over a decade. At the same time, White House spokespersons have expressed outrage at the death of seven aid workers, including one U.S. dual national during an IDF airstrike in Gaza. We were outraged to learn of an IDF strike that killed a number of civilian humanitarian workers yesterday from the World Central Kitchen, which has been relentless in working to get food to those who are hungry in Gaza and, quite frankly, around the world. Uh, we've spoken directly to the Israeli government about this particular incident. We've impressed upon the Israelis the absolute imperative of doing more to protect innocent civilian lives. The Biden administration has approved approximately 100 weapon sales since the October 7 attack by Hamas on Israel. These weapon sales were smaller and did not require congressional approval. According to the latest Gallup poll, 75 percent of Democrats disapprove of the military actions Israel has taken in Gaza. <laughs> President Biden is facing pushback from his own party and calls for ceasefire follow him throughout his campaign trail. In February, a group of 20 Democratic senators led by Senator Van Hollen of Maryland pressed Biden to require Israel to commit to international humanitarian law. 
Last month, Senator Chuck Schumer called Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu an obstacle to peace. And last night, a physician attending a White House meeting with Muslim community leaders walked out on the president after expressing his disapproval. The rhetoric that has been coming out of the Biden administration, that's been coming out of the White House, it's frustrated a lot of people, especially people who are Palestinian Americans, Muslim Americans, Arab Americans. We are not satisfied. Next week, when Congress reconvenes, lawmakers will have to address President Biden's $18 billion weapon sales request. And it is also expected that the House will put to a vote a $17 billion supplemental military aid package for Israel, also requested by the Biden administration. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. Does leniency in our criminal justice system in a largely insecure border embolden criminals? A former DHS official and former police officer says, yes, it does. Joining me now to talk about the recent incidents of illegal immigrant crime and attacks on law enforcement officers is Scott Erickson. He's the director of the Center for Law and Justice at the America First Policy Institute. Scott Erickson, thank you so much for joining us. It's good to be with you. Scott, uh, Lindy Jones and Guy Rivera, uh, both career criminals with extensive uh, criminal records, they were indicted for the murder of Officer Jonathan Diller, the New York City uh, police officer who was killed. Why were these individuals with such extensive uh, rap sheets uh, back on the streets, first of all, and what reforms do you think could have been in place to prevent this from happening? It's a question we shouldn't have to ask repeatedly day in, day out, week in, week out. Um, uh, they were out on the street because of bad policy, uh, bad progressive criminal justice policy under the guise of reform that attempts to keep people out of jail uh, and use alternatives to, to detention and other forms of, of, of monitoring. Uh, they just don't work that well. And when you have somebody who's been arrested 10, 15, 20 times, uh, often for violent crimes, um, there's no reason that person should be on the street. And so the officer uh, in New York, unfortunately, encountered that individual and lost his life as a result. In, in the state of Oregon, the governor just signing a bill into law that recriminalizes yeah. hard drugs. Um, we don't know what the effects of not having that in place, how many deaths that have sure. led to, but you know, with what we're talking about here, this bad policy is directly leading to the loss of life. Bad policies have consequences, and, and you, you know, this pie of the sky Pollyannish idea that you can decriminalize something and make it go away, well, the, the behavior is still going to occur, and in fact, it's going to occur in, a, in abundance when you decriminalize it and remove any sort of deterrence or accountability for the, for the actions of those individuals. And Oregon's a great example. You know, the use of drugs skyrocketed, untold numbers of, of young lives in particular were lost, and even in an extraordinarily liberal enclave like Oregon, they had to, 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 to pull back and realize what they did was wrong. So we saw those assaults on law enforcement, like the beating in Times Square uh, involving illegal immigrants. Are, is it le lenient state laws or lax border security or a combination thereof uh, that l leads to these attacks? And how can officers be better protected? Yeah, it's a culmination of all of the above, like you said. I mean, our border's largely insecure right now when anybody who wants to come across the border can do so. And what we saw down in Texas with the, the dozens and dozens of people bum-rushing the, uh, the officers and guard down there, I mean, that kind of stuff can't go unanswered. It has to be dealt with, and it has to be dealt with immediately. Because if you don't deal with it, you get people who feel emboldened to do anything. And then they come into jurisdictions like New York and elsewhere where the local criminal justice system is set up as being lenient and I would consider it to be more you know, pro-criminal and anti-victim. Uh, and you have people emboldened to do these things as they did in Times Square. So officers just need to take the basic precautions that they take every single day, which they're well, they're well trained, they understand officer safety, they understand what they have to do to get home at night. Um, the, the bigger issue is the demoralization that occurs in law enforcement when you as an officer are assaulted and the person assaulting you faces no accountability. And we saw that early on with Alvin Bragg when he came into office as the district attorney in Manhattan uh, on his infamous day one memorandum where he basically told his office that we're not gonna be charging any, uh, or certain categories of, of crime we're not going to be charging, including assaulting police officers. Now he pulled back on that pretty quick or tried to pull back on that. But that shows you the mindset. And if you're a police officer and you're literally under assault and the person who's assaulting you, and not just you, but the criminal justice system at large, it's an assault on our society, an assault on democracy, 
that person is just walking free as a result, it's extraordinarily demoralizing. And we don't have enough cops in the street because fewer and fewer people understandably want to get into the profession. I want to get your thoughts on uh, Shen Yun Performing Arts. This is a New York-based uh, performing arts troupe with a tagline, China Before Communism, uh, embraced around the world, essentially, Europe, the United States, Canada, um, only not allowed to be uh, you know, performed in China. Uh, Shen Yun is facing attacks right here on U.S. soil. This is believed to be linked to the CCP transnational repression. How can um, a foreign entity like the Chinese Communist Party infiltrate um, our own government? The Chinese Communist Party has um, has adherents and, and people all over the world that, that monitor their citizens and keep an eye and, and try to use intimidation tactics to prevent what they're doing, prevent their free exp expression of, of, of speech. And that's what's going on here with, with Shen Yun. And, and some of the attacks, whether it be vandalizing buses that could very well lead to catastrophic uh, accidents that could lead to death, whether it's calling in uh, false bomb threats, trying to um, upend or uh, intimidate individuals from exercising, again, their free expression. All of this stuff erodes the ability of these individuals, whether it's Shen Yun or, or any others, to, to express their uh, opinions on, on issues related to, to China. Scott Erickson, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Capitol Report. If you want to see our full broadcast, check us out at epochtv.com. <laughs>